Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Testing one, two, one, two, one, two. We'll keep an eye on it, but great, thank you. This morning, get ready to worship King Jesus. Before we get started, I have something on my heart. Um, I've been reading into the book of Daniel about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about how they were thrown into the fire, but then there was a fourth man in the fire. And I believe that today, there will be a fourth man in the fire that's about to be revealed to you. And you may, I don't know what you come in here with, I don't know what you're going through, but I hear the Lord say that you may have been thrown into the fire by the enemy, but the Lord says he's revealing himself to you this morning. And so I just want you to lift your voices to the king. Lift your voices, pray in tongues if you can speak in tongues, but stir up your hearts this morning, stir up your spirits this morning. And get ready to worship him. Leave everything at the altar this morning. Lift your voices. Yende la masin de la maso tolo sin de shia. Yende la masin de la maso te lo bo soto. 
Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place this morning. Make our hearts ready for you. There's a fourth man in the fire. There's a fourth man in the fire. There's a fourth man in the fire. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to us this morning. Let our hearts prepare the way for you, God. Let us prepare the way for King Jesus this morning. Holy Spirit. So Lord, I just pray right now that you reveal yourself to us. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Holy Spirit, we honor you. We love you. We give you praise and adoration. But Lord, I ask you just to reveal yourself to us, Lord. Show us visions throughout this whole room. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will be ready to seek your face. So let's worship. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voices. Amen. scripture says he will show up and his word says enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and one thing God does do is he responds to the sound of grateful people he responds to the sound of people who say thank you Lord for what you've done thank you Lord for who you are so I wonder if we could just take a few seconds to begin to lift up the name of Jesus and if you don't know what to say just say father I thank you father God I'm grateful is enough 
first giving honor to the Holy Spirit, who is the love of my life, the head of my life. You know, there are sometimes in prayer when I begin to think about how deep the mercy of God spans. And I had a thought one day, and it's a thought that hasn't kind of left me since. So we know that we serve the true and living God, right? And he is Father, Son, Spirit. Father who birthed the world in creation. Son who was sacrificed. Spirit that is within us, that hovered over the waters, that gave life to all that we know. And to think that that God would condense himself in such a way that when he came inside of us, we didn't literally die because of the weight and the magnitude of who he is. He would compact himself in such a way that this body, this flesh would be able to house him. But kind enough that he wouldn't compact his power so that we could still go out into the world and preach and teach, perform miracles and execute signs and wonders. God is not to be memorialized or to be seen as a thing of the past or a God you believe in because your parents believed in him. Intimacy with him is possible. Relationship with him is real. Experiences with him can be tangible because he's alive. Our God is alive. People build shrines to honor their gods. They use beads and they repeat the same prayers. But here we are, able to speak to a God in real time, in real life, and he responds in the very same way, in real time, in real life. So I would encourage you all today to really take advantage of this moment. He was here before I stepped on this mic. He was here before Pastor John asked me to come. He was here before this church was built. He was here before kings and queens were coronated and emperors were put on their thrones and presidents were elected for countries. He's been here. He is here. And he will always be here. And I don't know about you guys, but that fills me with so much joy to know that the God of the universe would think so much of us to be here with us today. We are loved. You are loved. You are loved. And he wants you to experience him today. No matter your age, no matter what you did this week, he wants you to experience him today. So for the next 10 seconds, before we go into a moment of singing songs to him, whether out loud or internally, say, Lord, I'm making room for you today. Visit me where I am. Say it just one more time. Lord, I'm making room for you today. Visit me where I am. Visit me where I am. Meet me where I am. Beyond me wanting a big check or a new car or a bigger house. I want you, Jesus. I want you. I 
I want you, Jesus. worthy worthy of every song we could ever sing along say worthy Say, holy, holy, say. 
coronation. And you know what? We heard a lot. It's like, oh God, here we go, here we go. Here comes the, you know, the correlation between the coronation and Jesus. I get it, right? But the fact of the matter is, yes, a king was coronated yesterday to rule over this land and other nations that it has um, authority over. But we serve the King of Kings. We serve the Lord of Lords. And so to everything that should believe that the King of this country is more powerful than the King of the universe, we're going to sing this song over Wimbledon, over our own lives, our own marriages, our education, everything. Because hear what? When you give God the room to be God, he has a no other choice than to be God. He cannot abide in a vessel that is full of pride where you believe you know what's best above him. How dare we believe in God and have plan B, C, D, E, F, and G. So we're putting the dominion back on his name today and we're giving him the room to reign over our lives again.
His spirit is here. His spirit is with us. Open up yourself to receive. We prayed the prayer. We said, God, we open up ourselves. Meet us where we are. Open up the gates of your heart that you would let him in today. There's something he wants to do beyond Pastor John laying hands, beyond Minister James giving a word or praying a prayer. There is a work he wants to do even now. Open up your heart to receive it. Open up your heart to receive it. Open up your mind to receive it. Open up your will to receive it. Forsake your will for his own, that he would be able to communicate what he desires to communicate with you today. Yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus. We open up ourselves to you now. We open up ourselves to you now. We open up ourselves to you now. We open up ourselves to you now, oh God. We open up ourselves to you now, oh God. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name, oh God. Do what you desire to do, Rede Alabanza. Do what you desire to do, oh God. From the beginning of creation to the very end, Father God, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, no matter the season, trial, tribulation, wilderness or in the palace, wherever we are, wherever our feet shall tread, there we shall proclaim your name because you are worthy. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, Jesus. 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 Is there anyone in here? that right now is going through a season of loneliness and that's because whether it's friends or family, you've almost been shut out or isolated because you've decided to live a life with Jesus Christ. Is there anyone in here? Or you've, please come to the front, please. Do you have? Yes, please, ministers, come. I felt the heart of the Lord for you in this moment. The Lord wants me to tell you that you'll be okay. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. You will be okay. lonely sometimes because parents, friends sometimes you relate even just by way of living similar lives, that's the point of relation and the place that you can be vulnerable with people but people grow and people change and our eyes get open to truth he removes scales from our eyes the closer we get to him 
So, it's okay. Because you're going to be okay. Because you're not doing it alone. You're not doing it alone. And as sure as the ministers are standing around you, are you here as well for the same thing? Okay. As sure as the ministers are around you, Jesus is even closer. Because he's inside of you. He's living, moving, speaking, not from here to here, but from here to here. It's not something that we have to keep running towards because he's in us. So the moment we say, Jesus, he's inside saying, hey, I'm here. You're not alone. You're not alone. Do you guys go to this church? Turn around. You guys in the audience, you're seeing their faces. You guys at the front, you're seeing theirs. You are not alone. And so, the church I'm from, when people are at the altar, we stretch our hands. And the pastor says, now everyone just breathe a word of prayer. And I want you to pray for these ladies as if you are praying for your yeah. daughter, or your mother, or your sister, or your friend. Pray for them like you know them, yeah, like the back of your hand. Pray for them as you pray for yourself. You know how you were praying when you really wanted that job. You need to pray just as hard for their souls. Come on and pray. Come on and pray. Come on and pray, because the healer, the comforter, the one who accompanies us on our journey is here. There is not one hurdle, not one trial, not one victory or loss that we face on our own. And so pray over these women that they would be reminded henceforth that Jesus, the God of the universe, is by their side. He is not only by their side, but he went before them. He trails behind them and he lives on the inside of them. Come on and pray as if it's your own soul in the balance. You are not alone. I hear the Lord saying you are not alone. You are not by yourself. And we curse and we silence the voice of loneliness right here, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. We remind your daughters that they are not alone, that they face nothing alone, that they do not make decisions alone, that they do not go about their day-to-day -day routine alone, for you are with them. High, low, summer, rain, no matter what the season, you are with them. And we pray, Father God, that concerning them, the people that have turned their face from them, the people that have turned the cold shoulder towards them, we decree and declare that by way of your light shining brightly through their lives, those same people that once cursed their decision will come to know you as your Lord and their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father God, that through the miracles, through the signs, through the wonder, through the peace, through the joy, through the stability, Father God, that those who once said you are making the worst decision of your life will be able to recognize that they made the best decision of their life and they'll be able to recognize that they too want to make the same decision be reminded that when you are when you are in Christ it might just come with some persecution even from the people you love but the Bible tells us to take joy take joy you know why? Because it's producing something in you that when they see you, they won't be able to look over. Those same people will be like, oh, so how, how's the church been going? You going this Sunday? Oh, I'm not working, so I'll just come with you. Do you want me to pick you up? Or can I jump in the car with you? Oh, I'll meet you there. Let's go get coffee before we go. Those same people. Trust me. Because when Jesus... Not Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, Krishna, Guru, Nanak. When Jesus does a work on the inside of us, it cannot be denied. 
We all prayed the prayer. Lord, I'm here. Meet me where I am. And because you decided to yield yourself, he met you where you were. And now you have a whole slew of people behind you holding your hands, sisters and brothers. Don't, I know it's intimidating at first because everyone's going to want to hug you. And, Let me get your number in, Sam. Okay. But that's all right. That's all right. You're not alone. Jesus Christ is with you. Can we just clap our hands that the God of the universe met these beautiful women where they were today? Oh, come on, you should rejoice. This is a miracle. This is a sign. This is a wonder. That he would answer prayers praying in private, in public. God bless you guys. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord a big clap of praise? Come on. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just give someone near you a hug. Welcome them to the house of the Lord. Give them a hug. Hallelujah. I actually want it a little bit louder in there and a little bit less in the two sides, if that's possible. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. If you're alive this morning, give me a shout. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Can we just give Becca folks a big round of applause this morning? Yeah, come on. Give us some honor. Give us some love. Yeah, come on. That's it. All across this room. We honor you, woman of God. We love your passion, your zeal for the Lord. You know, I was uh, praying for you before the service and the Lord uh, just showed me a new contract that the Lord was going to be bringing into your life. And I actually feel it's even right now in this season, I actually saw you put in pen to paper and the Lord just releasing a fresh new sound from you in this season. And so will you just reach out a hand to Becca right now? Uh, I often say to people, you're never in this house by chance. It's like... When the Lord wants to release something, he sends people over to us. And I go, you come to bless us, but the Lord says, I'm shifting seasons over your life right now. And I see you just ascending a ladder in this season. And the Lord says, it's time to come even higher. For the Lord says, you're only now beginning to rise, says the Lord. And the Lord says, even though I've increased influence, your influence is going to go to a new level in this next season. For the Lord says, put pen to paper, my hand is upon this. And so far, right now in the name of Jesus we thank you for Becca we thank you for the prophetic edge that is upon our ministry and we blow upon the prophetic gift this morning in Jesus name we thank you for songs of heaven father we pray that you tap into the oil in this season Father, we thank you that you're shifting things in the spirit right now in Jesus' name. Whoa, we thank you. Oil, oil. Just, just prophesy oil. Just declare it over her right now in Jesus' name. Oil. Hey. Fresh oil upon her worship. We thank you for it, Jesus. Mande, ke, 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 rababondo, mande, hey. Manda shimanda babande bebende hey. We thank you, Holy Ghost. And I even see a crusade field. I believe the Lord's going to open a door for for worship. I see um, you're on a crusade field, and I, I, it's not something I'd ever kind of see for you. I'm, I always see you kind of doing the kind of uh, just the, the the worship events and things like that, and just the the sound that the Lord has for you. But I believe there's going to be a fresh rawness in this season to take people into the presence and the Lord says it's even going to be out of your comfort zone that even the Lord leads you to a place where you'd say this isn't what I would choose right now for my life but the Lord says there's going to be oil in this season in Jesus name and everyone said come on yeah give the Lord a hand We've just got back from Poland. We've been on mission in Poland. And can I tell you, 
We saw more breakthrough than we've ever seen before in Poland. I've been to Poland many years. I've been over there and often it's quite traditional. It's quite religious at times. Um, but I tell you, the Holy Spirit showed up in a way that I've never experienced in Poland before. In fact, every person in the meeting said they had never been in meetings like it before in their life. Isn't that awesome? That's I tell you, it was so powerful, and we just saw lives being changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it truly was revival. But who knows, that was yesterday. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I need some manna for today. Yeah. Give me my daily bread. Come on, is anyone ready for something today? Yeah. I don't live in the past, whether that's five years ago or whether it's yesterday. I live for today. Yeah. I need a touch from heaven today. You know, I've discovered there are three things that the religious spirit doesn't like. Can we talk about this for a moment? The first thing the religious spirit doesn't like is power. Everyone say power. You know, when God really manifests his power, the religious spirit always reacts. You know, whenever Jesus healed the sick, they would say, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Are you serious? Someone has just received a miracle and all you care about is what day of the week it was done on. You know, when the power of the Holy Spirit hits a room, sometimes the flesh cannot stand in that power. Who knows what I'm talking about? You know, whether people shake, whether they fall on the floor. I don't care whether you fall on the floor or shake. I care whether you experience power. Who knows, too many people fall on the floor and then they get back up exactly the same. I want to fall on the floor and I want to come up in the power of the Holy Spirit. But there is power for you today. There is power in this room today. Can you say amen? amen? And if that doesn't offend you, then maybe one of the other things will offend you this morning. There's power for healing. Can I tell you, prophecy offends the religious spirit. I've even known people that they believe in the power, but they still get offended by prophecy. I even know Pentecostal ministers they believe in Pentecost, but prophecy, mm, I'm not sure about that. But I've discovered every time the Holy Spirit is poured out, people prophesy. He says, and I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then what happens? Every time the Spirit is poured out, people prophesied. Who knows? When the Spirit came up upon a man called um, um, Saul, he began to prophesy. The, the, the Spirit of God is, is, is the Holy Spirit and His voice is not devoid of a presence. Often we separate God's voice from the God who speaks that voice. I need a little bit less compression. We separate the voice from the person. Are you hearing me? Every voice that speaks from heaven originates from a person. Don't ever separate God's voice from God. And God is not a God who has not got a voice. Who knows we have one mouth and two ears. That means we need to hear twice as much as we speak. It's a good principle for life. And it's a good principle in the spirit. Too many people approach God. They speak to God. God, give me this. Give me that. God, what do you say about my destiny? What do you say about my future? Amen. And then they walk off. Who knows? You're meant to pray and then hear what the Lord has to say for you. He wants a relationship. He's not looking for a one-way dialogue where we treat him like a vending machine. He's looking for a people who will commune with him. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Everyone say power. Everyone say prophecy. The third thing that offends the religious spirit is prosperity. Uh-uh. 
In fact, I don't believe that there is anything more offensive to the religious spirit than prosperity. Oh, you talk about money, you get to find out where people are at. You say, Pastor John, do you believe in prosperity? Yeah. And you can call me a prosperity preacher. I no longer care anymore. I've discovered I'm not living for anyone's approval. I'm not looking for another minister to put their stamp of approval upon my life. I've decided I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm going to believe what the Bible says. And the Bible is full of power. The Bible is full of prophecy. And I want to tell you, the Bible is full of prosperity. I'm sorry, but Jesus did not die for you to stay in poverty. And I refuse to believe a lie that says, as a believer, you must be poor. And so if me preaching prosperity offends you, then I'm sorry, but I'm just going to give you the Bible. Who knows that in the Old Testament, every man and woman of God was blessed. And when I say blessed, I don't just mean a little bit blessed. I mean they had cattle, they had wealth, they had increase. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Solomon had more gold than there was ever even possible. The blessing of the Lord maketh one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. This is the Bible. You say, Pastor John, that's Old Testament. So you're going to tell me that God was a better God in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament? Same God. Same God. In fact, we have a new covenant which is even greater, come on someone, than the old covenant. Now, is your prosperity as a New Testament believer for you to sit in your big house with your flashy car and your gold rings? Can I tell you, no, it's not. We are blessed in order to be a blessing. There is a flow that comes to the New Testament believer that says, I'm not here just to get rich, but I'm here to make a difference with my wealth. You see, I've discovered the people who hate this message the most are normally the people that love money the most. You talk about money, they don't want to hear it because they like holding on to their money. They they say, Pastor John, why do you talk about money all the time? Why? Because I need money to stop having a hold on you. If, you don't, if, if you're a giver, if money no longer has a hold on you, if you say, freely I receive, freely I give, if he asks me for every penny, I'll give it to him. You say, come on, preacher, preach it. Because you believe in the power of giving and receiving. But when you don't believe in this, you just want me to shut up so that we can get on to the next thing. People that love money the most are the people that don't want to hear about it. I don't love money. I, I, I've given God everything on more than one occasion. Yeah. More than one occasion. I, we were in a meeting and the Lord spoke to me and said, so everything in your bank account. <laughs> Who knows, sometimes that's easier <laughs> than at other times. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you are like, that's pretty much once a month the Lord says that to me. It was a sacrifice. I'd been working hard. I'd been saving. I'd been building up. And I had my little pot of money for a rainy day. And God says, today is the day it rains. I sold that money. And I thought at the time, I was like, okay, Lord. I didn't realize that within three months, there wouldn't just be that money, but that money times two in my bank account. I'm not talking a small amount. And I'm a pastor on a salary. I tell you when God does it, that's supernatural. And then the Lord said, do it again. No joke. You know what I did? I did it again. And I'm believing God that God's going to do his part again. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it again. Just tell the person next to you, do it again. 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 
Why? Because I've decided that money no longer has a hold on me. And if he wants it, he can have it. I'm not living in a way that says I need to build. I'm living in a way that says he's in control of my life. And that whatever he wants, he can have. And whatever he wants me to have, he can get to me. And if that offends you, I have no problem with it. I need the seats. (laughs) Hallelujah. If I can't offend you with the power, I'm going to offend you with the prophecy. And if I can't offend you with the prophecy, I'm going to offend you with the prosperity. Come on, can can someone say amen to that? But if you'll read your Bible, you'll realize that everything we preach is in the Bible. Yeah, I sometimes wonder how people can come to the conclusions they come to. Because if they just read the Bible, they would discover The truth of God's word. If you have to explain it using one little scripture, then you're probably deceived. Because if you read the general picture of the Bible, you discover that the concepts we talk about are throughout the Bible. The spirit is always poured out. People begin to prophesy. The blessing of the Lord turns lives around, not just financially, but spiritually. In your soul, healing, deliverance, freedom. He's a God that has come to set you free. Can you say amen to that this morning? If we can put the details on the screen, you can sow this morning using the bank details or the offering baskets as they come. But Father, we pray right now for the power of the Holy Spirit to be released upon this room. We pray right now that every person would hear your voice, even that your voice as to what they should give this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would bless this people abundantly, pressed down, shaken together, running over in Jesus' name, that it would be poured out into their lap. Father, that I pray that if they want lemons, they'd sow lemon seed. But as they want money, they would sow money. I just hear the Lord just saying, you know, we use that phrase, money doesn't grow on trees. Anyone heard that? Can I tell you it's a lie? Who knows the world lies to you? Who knows? If you want lemons, what do you plant? Lemon seeds. If you want apples, what do you plant? If you want money, what do you plant? Money. You plant money to get money. You reap what you sow. So where does money go? Money grows on trees. (laughs) So Father, we bless the seed of finance in this house this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can pass the baskets around. Do what you need to do. Details are on the screen. If you've done a bank transfer before, you know exactly what to do. I want to encourage you as well. So every month, be a tither in this house. We believe in 10%. Everyone say 10. 10. Not 5, not 6, but 10%. Everyone count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. Just tell your neighbor 10. <laughs> oh, Jesus. If it's your first time here at Elam Wimbledon, give me a wave. Do we have any first-time guests here this morning? Just keep your hand raised up. Let's just welcome our first-time guests this morning. There is a card in front of your chair. You can see that, a Connect card. Fill it in, put your name, mobile number. We'll add you to a text service, and um, we'll tell you about all of our events coming up. We've also got our growth track, which is about to uh, take place in two weeks' time, Saturday, May the 20th. You'll hear about our vision. You'll hear about our beliefs. We'll also discover your gifts and talents And we will connect you in with a small group and a serving team. So that's here on Saturday, uh, May the 20th. Uh, Come and get connected. If you want to get involved in the church, that's your next step. So if you've not done that course, that is your next step to get connected um, here at the church. We want to see you there. And we'll give you pizza. Hallelujah. Also, just to say, this Friday is Radiance. Where's my ladies in the house? 
We've got Joe Norton with us. Joe is an incredible woman of God over in Wembley. In fact, in a few months' time, James's wife, uh, Becca, is here with us. I don't even know if you know that, but <laughs> he's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> But Becca's here with us, and we've got our Warrior Women's Conference also coming up. Come on, give the Lord. Jenny Weaver is in the house. If you are a lady, I want to tell you now, do not miss this conference. It's going to be so powerful. And we've also got Occupy Conference coming up also at the beginning of September. So there's, there's lots going on. On top of that, our men have their uh, quiz night. Where's my men? There's one man. Where's my men? Hey, that's more like it. Come on. And so men, we're out. We're doing a quiz night, and then we're also going to have a bit of time with the Holy Spirit as well. Who knows, as men, we don't always have to do things that are not God-related. Our aim as men is to find our roar again. And so we're going to have a bit of time of fellowship together and then we're going to invite the Holy Spirit just to come and minister to us as men and just enjoy that time together. And again, it includes pizza. Thank you, Jesus. So get along to that. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Well, I want to introduce our speaker this morning. He's a friend of this house. Uh, He's been here many times And I can say this, that in the past, actually, he's one of, I would say, a handful of ministers. In fact, I could probably only think of two other ministers that I actually choose to travel when I invite because I trust him. You know, sometimes I want to be here when a minister is here, not because of any other reason than I want to make sure that what they're saying is biblical. But I find that James Aladurain is an incredible man of God. He's a man of the word. He's a man of prayer. And for me, those are the most important things. I, I, I don't care um, how much of an influence they have upon the earth. I don't care how recognized they are by other ministers. I care whether they are recognized in heaven. And I know that this is a man that is known in heaven. He's known in hell. He's known upon the earth. And I value him. I honor the gift that's upon him. I don't believe he's just a man of prayer, but I believe he's a prophet for this age. And so will you give James Aladurain a big Elam Wimbledon welcome as he comes this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oops. Thank you. You may be seated. I don't know if I can get my keyboard player. It's not my keyboard player, but we have the guy who was playing the keys. I hope he's not gone out because I don't like these musicians that play and leave. When it's time, come back wherever you are. Someone say, come back in. <laughs> I often tell people that I work with, you know, uh, musicians, singers, everyone, we're in for the word, we're in for every part of it. I don't like when preachers only come in for when it's time to preach. I'm, I'm thinking, what's that about? Sorry, that's, that wasn't how I was meant to start this, by the way. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'd love you to just play something kind of uh, pad, strings, um, if you know House of Prayer, that kind of vibe. Go for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Last time I was here, I feel like the UK was going through a transition at that time. And I'm back here again, and it's going through another transition. (laughs) And when I was sat there, um, I just got this scripture, because obviously you all know yesterday was a very important uh, uh, day for the UK. And if anything, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, sections of the whole uh, ceremony was when the prime minister was reading Colossians 1. Can I get witness? <laughs> I was looking at my wife like, can anyone feel the power in this? He's not a believer, but he's declaring. <laughs> well, he's not a believer yet, yet. He's a spiritual man, though. He's a spiritual man. <laughs> anyway, when it was, and so as I reflect on the whole ceremony, I'm just realizing that as much as this nation tried to uh, almost disconnect itself, from its heritage, as much as the secular media would like to say, we're no longer a Christian nation, and all these declarations, I believe yesterday was a declaration. 
that in the DNA and in the roots of this nation are values that align with Jesus, the kingdom, the purpose of God. And it was announced across the media. They couldn't turn it off. <laughs> they had to listen to scripture being declared. Listen, you cannot underestimate the power of that. I, I, mean, I think I was watching Sky and one of the commentators, he didn't even, ref, he was saying, oh, the prime minister read, I can't remember the word he used, but he didn't use the Bible, he used something random. I was like, it's the Bible he read. <laughs> Probably didn't even know it was the Bible, but it was so powerful. Now, this scripture, I believe it's prophetic, and it just gives me a bit of a, I guess, a template, an idea of why I feel the Lord is doing in this season. I want to release this before we go into the word. It's Job 14, 7. It says, for there is hope for a tree, if it's cut down, that it will sprout again. And its tender roots will not cease. Listen to this part. Though its roots may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water, it will bird and bring forth branches like a plant. Yesterday was a sense of water. <laughs> the Lord releasing his word across the nation. And so, you know what? I just feel stirred to pray right now. So, Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We know you've not forgotten the United Kingdom. And even as I just released this word from Job, Father, I thank you that your word has been released across the land broadcast across the nations by people that don't even believe in you that didn't even know what they were doing even some of the people reading the scriptures had no idea the power of what they were releasing but lord we know your word will not return void so as your word has been released father over this nation we say let the roots that have grown old and maybe even dying because of all kinds of immor immoral decisions being made in government father let the water of your word the life begin to come again over the united kingdom and lord we're believing for a great outpouring of your spirit we're not going to let go we're not going to give up we're going to keep believing for that which you want to do so move again father move again father again and again in government move again father again in the politics in the media and entertainment in arts father in schools in universities lord with sons and daughters with the younger generation move again father in the name of jesus amen thank you holy ghost father as we go into your word we thank you for revelation we thank you for transformation we don't, want just, we, we don't just want to hear words. We want to hear from your heart, the burden for this moment. I want it to bring about a shift. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Uh, thank you once again, uh, John, for having me. It's interesting, the last couple of times I've been here, you've not been here. <laughs> well, it's good to have you finally. <laughs> uh, how many of you have never heard me speak before? This is your first time. You've never heard me speak before. Okay, a few of you, okay. So you kind of know, uh, for those of you, most of you already know a bit about me. I'm not going to go into details about me, but I'm married. I've got three kids. Um, I've been married for, it's going to be 11 years in July. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, I lead a ministry called Prayer Storm, and it's been going since 2009. So it's about 13 years, 14 years now. And so it's been a while, and God has been good, and I'm not going to go into the history of what we do and why we do what we do, but our heart is to see a revolution across the United Kingdom. Uh, we believe God is not finished uh, with the nation. The United Kingdom has a lot of bad things in its history, slavery, all kinds of weird things. But in the midst of all that, God has moved in this land. You know, and there are things that God wants to redeem. This nation has an apostolic mandate, an apostolic calling. And uh, I believe God is going to raise this nation up. Some of you, I look across the crowd. You know, many of you are from different nations. Maybe your parents are from different nations. You didn't realize it, but, you know, you're not here by accident. You are not in the United Kingdom, in Wimbledon, in, Wimbledon, in, this, in London, at this time by accident. God has orchestrated things to, to make it happen such that you would be in this place at this time. So there's, there's a lot that you carry that this nation needs. Do you hear me? 
the giftings you carry. You may not realize it, but this nation needs it. So that's why you can't afford to be under a victim mentality. Did you hear what I said? Many people live under a victim mentality. Can I go here? Listen, you're probably going to get offended and you're probably going to get mad and that's okay. I'm not upset that you get mad. I just need to be faithful to what I need to release. Many Christians, especially black people, live with a victim mentality. Did you hear me? Everything is not racism. Everything is not right. I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. But some people live under that thing for so long that everything that happens around them, quick to label it racism. Okay. I'm a missionary. So the way I approach things in life and service to God... I have come to understand it's very different to the way many believers do. But that's because I have been wired as a missionary. I was born on the mission field. So my dad is from Nigeria. My mom is from Ghana. I was born in Liberia. I live in Manchester. My wife is from Stockport. I have got missionary DNA in me. The reason why I was born in Liberia is because my dad was a missionary to Liberia. The reason why we moved to Manchester is because the Lord spoke to my parents about moving because my dad was pastor in a church. Things were going great. The church was growing. And God said, I've called you as a missionary not to sit in a church as a pastor. So he had to move and leave all of that to start again from scratch without any support. I am a missionary at heart. So let us back up a bit. The United Kingdom has a lot of... Uh, not so good things in its history. A lot of terrible things that this nation has done. And I'm not trying to say those things are okay. But we cannot shy away from the fact that God has still used this nation. My Bible is called King James. God still used this nation. And there is a perverted move even in the black uh, 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 kind of uh, I guess maybe even black in, in America and some parts of the world where it's like Christianity is a white man's religion. That is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> Jesus was Middle Eastern. Jesus did not have blonde hair. Why, why am I going here today, Lord? <laughs> so this nation has done some bad things. But God actually has a calling and used this nation, Mary Slessor. Hey, you don't know Mary Slessor? Yeah. Research her. She stopped the killing of twins in Nigeria. Many missionaries from these shores, Pa Elton. You all know Pa Elton? He, was, he is the father of the Pentecostal movement in Nigeria. And he's right from the United Kingdom. Yeah. He, he moved. In fact, I believe his wife is still alive right now in the old age, dying like speaking the language, eating the food, learning the culture. But because of their sacrifice, they fathered a revival movement. He fathered people like uh, 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 Ben Sinodahosa and some of these great people who have come out of Nigeria. It was a British man that went to Nigeria as a missionary. Now, those are more recent missionaries. There are other missionaries that went to Nigeria and parts of Africa before him. Some of them took their coffins with them. So now I, I, I want to focus on the side, uh, the, the, the good that has come out of the United Kingdom. Some of the missionaries that left these shores took their coffins with them. Do you understand the significance of that? In other words, they left without even considering that they were coming back. So they took their coffins that they knew they were going to be buried in. And many of them died there. Some of your, father, some of your forefathers, black people, killed them. Do you realize that? But they were okay to die for the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. The United Kingdom also did some terrible things. I'm talking about the things that God was in. Okay? Are you hearing me? Those missionaries left the United Kingdom ready to die. Some of you have migrated to the United Kingdom from West Africa and from other nations. 
They left here ready to die. You come here wanting to live. I am a missionary in my DNA. So if I'm coming here, it's because God sent me here. And if I'm coming, it's because God has sent me to the people of this land. So I'm not here just to get around all my friends that look like me and talk like me and like the same thing I like just because I'm not comfortable with a different culture. I am a missionary. I'm meant to be in a different culture. That's the whole idea, to influence that culture. And what you don't realize is that as an African or people, Afro-Caribbean, all of us, there is something you carry in your spiritual DNA that the United Kingdom needs. The white church needs it. Can I, can I be real this morning? The United Kingdom, the white church needs, you may not realize it needs it, but it actually needs it because God wants to revive his work in this land. And there is a demonic cultural Christianity that has been accepted as norm over the whole culture. A fish in water does not know it's wet. When you're under a culture for so long, sometimes you don't even realize what you're under. So many of you have come here and you're adopting a victim mentality. I'm not saying things are not being done and horrible against you. I'm not saying God is not God of justice. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not demeaning all those things, but I want you to realize you are not a victim. Even though it may appear as though things are being done against you, Okay, let's reverse it. The missionaries who left uh, the UK and went to Nigeria and the ones that were killed there, how did they see themselves? They saw themselves as ones who were ready to die for the gospel. And so it didn't matter what the cost was, they were ready to give themselves for God. Look at the apostles. They gave themselves. It was all about preaching and giving themselves for the purpose of God. I believe we need to resurrect the message of martyrdom. People who are ready to die for what they believe in. Giving everything. So, I see a lot of people living under this victimhood, this victim mentality. And you don't realize it stunts your growth. It, it actually affects the impact that God has called you to have. Because you're looking through a lens of offense. You are a Christian before you are black. Many black pastors won't say this, especially even in America. They put being black on top of everything else. You are a son and a, you're a son of God, and that includes women as well, way before you are a Nigerian, before you're an English person, before you're Caribbean. Your kingdom culture has to trump everything else. So everything has to be filter through the lens of the kingdom. What are heaven's values? Now, let me restate. I am not demeaning all the things that we know goes on in our culture. But too many people hide there. And many people hide with, uh, with, uh, uh, under the banner of, of racism. And, and they're there, but really, they're not dealing with hurts from the past and wounds that, that, uh, that have things that have been done to them that racism and all these other negative things are kind of exposing. And, and it's like the situations around them is exposing wounds that have not been healed properly. And so even though I am not okay with racism, I really do believe for many people that are dealing with a lot of these issues, God wants to do a deeper healing in you. That's beyond what's been done to you. Because what's been done to you may never stop. But when he has healed you inside, it doesn't matter what they do, you're not going to come under it. Am I making sense? Because the healing starts from the inside. And for some people, it's a generational thing. You don't even know you're under it. You don't even know you're dealing with rejection. It's generational. And so you have to be... It's it's interesting that sometimes you're the last person to know you've got bad breath. Isn't that true? Or... Or B.O., you're the last person to know you have it. Everyone else feels the impact apart from you. Well, that's the same with internal wounds and, and all these issues, emotional baggage. 
Sometimes you're the last one to know what's going on. And everyone else can see that you're reacting from rejection. You're reacting from pain. But you're just blind to it. You're not emotionally intelligent enough to realize, goodness me, every relationship I'm in, this happens. To say, okay, there must be something going on in me. Lord, what's going on? on. Get yourself before the Lord. And then you realize you have father wounds. You have trust issues. But you've not got to the place to confront it. So you're projecting onto everyone else. And that's not to say those people don't have problems too. But you are projecting all your issues on them without actually looking at what's going on in here. Whereas what God wants to do, he wants to heal you from the inside. And so when people do the things they are going to do, racism and they're going to hurt you, they're going to steal these horrible things, you operate from a different place, not from the place of unhealed wounds. I don't even know why I said all this, because this has nothing to do with what I am planning or why I felt the Lord wanted me to speak on. But Father, I pray if there's anyone here that's dealing with rejection. There's a woman here, you're dealing with a spirit of rejection. I think a relationship just ended. And it's like it's a repetition you're seeing in your life where it goes so far and then it ends. And you you think to yourself, well, what have I done wrong? And so you're dealing with this rejection and you're looking at life through this rejection. Father, right now I'm asking that you'll stretch your hand towards this lady and bring wholeness, healing in her heart. Lord, I come against that spirit of rejection, that mindset, that, that, that kind of perspective, the stronghold in the mind that's causing her to see life in a distorted perspective. Lord, would you release your healing over those areas of brokenness? You're the great surgeon, Holy Spirit. Reach down into hearts right now, not just this person, but other people in here dealing with rejection and bring your healing from the inside out, from the inside out, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we want you. We're people of your kingdom. We want to live as you want us to live. We want to do what you've called us to do with the purest of motives. So, Father, let every contamination in emotions be exposed and expelled by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we're going to be looking at um, Matthew, Matthew, um, Matthew 16. And this is a passage many of you would know. But this is what was impressed upon my heart as I prayed um, about what to speak this morning. Matthew 16, verse 13. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. This is a passage that's loaded with so much um, insight, revelation, and things that I believe the Lord uh, is saying to the church. But there are a few things I want to point your attention to here uh, that I feel is very relevant for this season that we're in as the people of God. Uh, Jesus asked his disciples about who people think he is. So he's actually wondering what people think about him. And they give all these words, as I've just read, and uh, he then asked them a question, saying, but who do you say that I am? In other words, what is your personal revelation of me? Not what have you heard other people say about me? What is your personal revelation of me? 
We're living at a time where God is wanting you to have a personal revelation of God. Because when the devil shows up at your house, it's not necessarily the time for you to call Apostle John Featherstone. Hey, Apostle, the devil is in my house right now. Pray for me. Because God is wanting you to have your own encounter. And when you have your own encounter, you can walk in authority. Because authority is a secondary consequence of intimacy. Because Jesus said to his disciples in Mark, was it somewhere around early parts of Mark, uh, before he picked his disciples uh, and, you know, gave them the title apostles and all that, he said he called his disciples that they should be with him. Okay, he called his disciples to himself that they should be with him and then that he might send them out to preach. That is the King James. It says that, so he called his disciples that they should be with him and then that he might send them out to preach. So the purpose of calling his disciples to himself was not for them to get a message to go and preach. Did you hear me? The purpose of calling his disciples to himself was for intimacy's sake, that they might be with him. That was the goal, that they might be with him. And then he would decide if he, if he wants to send them to preach. But these days is the reverse. We want to come to Jesus to get a message to go and preach. We want to come to Jesus so that we are anointed and so that all our problems go away and all these other reasons. But we're, we're not really coming to be with him. So he sent them out with authority, but that authority came as a result of intimacy. So the authority was a byproduct of their intimate walk with him. So Jesus asked the disciples here, who do you say? Because what you say comes from, what did he say? They are of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he's probing not just their words, but their hearts. What is going on in your heart about me? What level of encounter do you have about, uh, do you have of me? Not just what have you heard other people say about me. And this is one of the amazing things about settings like this. You come to church, you can listen to messages all you want from morning to night. Messages will not change you. Now, when we do what we do right here, if we're prepared properly, what happens as we speak is uh, not just information. Now, let me just back up. There's some places you go to where when the word is being preached, all that's been dispensed from the platform is information. Now, the information may be accurate, but do you realize you can be theologically right and spiritually wrong? You can preach a theologically accurate message from the wrong spirit. Didn't the slave girl say to Paul, these are the servants of the Most High? She was accurate. You couldn't fault her, in quote, theologically. But she was operating from another source. And so, you can... Be in a place where you speak words from a platform and you're releasing information. Information reaches the head. And so you have many Christians with big heads and small hearts. Because all they've received from the platform is information. And so they can recite scriptures, but they haven't met the scripture. The fact that you can quote a scripture does not mean you know it. Because scriptures are gateways into realms of encounter. There's some things you don't know until you encounter. It's crazy that in the West, we celebrate knowledge and and education so much. People can go to university and have a business degree. It doesn't mean they know anything about business until they start their own business. There's some things you don't know until you experience. And so thank God for information. I'm not demeaning information, but I'm saying it can't stop there. Information has to lead to revelation. And then revelation becomes impartation, which leads to transformation. Listen, when you receive information and you receive words like this, if we have prepared properly, it translates from information and we're actually releasing impartations as we speak. 
However, for that to lead to transformation, that impartation needs to go through incubation. Do you know what incubation is? Your secret place. You don't change by just hearing sermons. It's when it's been imparted by the Spirit and then you go into incubation mode and then that begins to grow in you and then it begins to change you from the inside out. You can listen to all the best preachers you want. First off, not everyone that's preaching is preaching from the Spirit. Fire begets fire. If they haven't been baked in fire, they're just going to be releasing information and theology. That is good to an extent, but that will not transform people. See, that's why many people come to church for years and never change. They've listened to the best preachers, but they've not changed. You know why? There was no incubation. Lots of information. They didn't know how to take what they were receiving and go into the closet and begin to groan and begin to pray. And they say, Lord, let that... Didn't Paul say, didn't he say, my little children whom I travail, I travail until Christ is formed. So there is a dimension of travail in prayer that causes formations in the spirit. And when those formations take place, that is when change happens. That is when behavioral patterns change. That's when strongholds come down. You cannot outsource your battle. There are battles that God has prepared for you to fight. So you cannot say, oh, this lion and this bear is too difficult for me. I can't be bothered. And call the pastor to pray for you. No, no, no. God set up the lion. God allowed the lion and the bear to be there as part of your training. Because you're going to grow through that battle. Because there's a Goliath coming down the road. So some Christians are wanting quick fixes. Lay hands on me, man of God. And I'm not demeaning the anointing to break yokes and destroy yokes and all these things. That's going to still keep happening. But ultimately, God wants to raise up an army. And if he's going to raise up an army, that means we all need to be soldiers. We can't be an army if you're not a soldier. And if you're going to be a soldier, it means you need to understand how to use your weapons. It means you need to know the protocol of ascending the hill of the Lord. It means you need to know how to encounter God. It means you need to know how to encourage yourself in the Lord. When you're depressed, and by the way, I get depressed too. Preachers are not exempt from depression. Can I get an amen? There are times when demonic, uh, for me, when it happens, I know it's demonic. But because I understand how to use my weapons, it's just a matter of I know how to ascend the hill and get rid of it. I'm not saying I don't feel it, but I know how to deal with it. Do you know how to deal with your demonic depression? And just to put a disclaimer out there, I understand that demonic uh, de depression can be chemical imbalances and all that. That's not my experience. I'm talking about the demonic kind. There are a lot of things that go on that we don't fully understand, but I'm telling you, a lot of things that many of us experience have their source in demonic manipulations. And so you have to learn how to fight. But a lot of these things does not come by just hearing information. It's when you've taken it into your closet and it's now become a part of you. You've been praying through it. God is using it to form you on the inside. The Holy Spirit is breathing on that word. You know? And then that word begins to bring a shift in you. So Jesus is concerned about what you say about him. And what you say is based on what's going on in your heart about him. Your personal encounter with him. So let's move on. Then he says to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Which actually backs up the point I'm just making. There's a dimension of revelation that can come from flesh and blood. What did he say? Flesh and blood did not reveal. So that means flesh and blood can also reveal. You can, you can study with just human intellect. When I was at university, I remember going to a seminar, but a, 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 a Muslim guy was re, re, pretty much just teaching the Bible. But he didn't have an encounter with God. He had an encounter maybe in a sense with the written word, but he had not met the living word. So you can intellectually go through this book. This book is a locked book. Unless you have the key of the Holy Ghost. This book is, is sealed off. Unless you have the Holy Ghost opening it to you. You can read it all you want with your intellect. You're not going to get in. 
In fact, your level of revelation right now in scripture is, is commensurate to your level of maturity and encounter with God. Because as you grow in God, you're going to go back to scriptures you read five years ago. And you're going to go, oh my goodness, what was I thinking when I read it back then? Because right now, another realm has opened up. It is the book that's always opening new realms and new dimensions. And so you can intellectually understand this. And flesh and blood can show you things. But Jesus is saying, Peter, flesh and blood didn't show you this. What you received, Peter, came from my father. You received it by revelation. You received it by a download from heaven. Now, we don't know the insight as to how Peter received this. But I doubt Peter heard an audible voice. How did Peter know? Well, we can only speculate. I guess he had impression on his heart. I guess he had a knowing. I wonder if he had words stirred up in his heart. Because this is how the things of the Spirit happen. He puts impressions and knowing. He puts a picture. There's a sense. And so he just spoke. Maybe when he spoke, he didn't even realize that he just received from heaven. Some of you are saying God is not speaking to you. He has been speaking all along. You just didn't realize. Oh, oh, oh. You remember Samuel? God called Samuel. And Samuel heard God. But he went to Eli. What does that mean? He could not discern that it was God speaking. Until he discerned it was God, he couldn't know God. So the Lord is speaking, but oftentimes the problem is we are not discerning it's him. He's speaking to you, but you're going to something else. He's speaking to you, but you thought it was just your thoughts. He's speaking to you, you thought it was just some random dream that came from pizza. Are you hearing me? Because you are like uh, Samuel in his early stages who did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. Not that God had not been speaking to him. God was speaking to him, but the word of the Lord had not yet started to train him because he did not yet know how to discern the Lord. Maturity starts to take place when we start to discern the movements of God in our lives. You have to become a student of the move of God in your life. Each of us has a unique spiritual shape. John Hare, his shape in the spirit might be a javelin. Might be. My shape might be a battle axe. Her shape might be a bow and an arrow. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So God is going to train me in a specific way commensurate with the shape he's giving me in the spirit. That's why you have unique anointings and manifestations and operations. You need to understand that this is not just for people on the platform. You have a unique shape in the spirit. And as you begin a journey with God, you start to understand, oh, this is how the spirit works with me. When he leads me this way, this is what happens. But you know what? It may work for you, but it won't work for the other person. Because God is a relational being. He doesn't deal, it's it's not like one size fits all. There are some basic principles that apply to all of us. But then as we grow in God, there are unique ways in which it starts to deal with us and work with us and train us up. So you need to start to discern the voice. We don't know how Peter received this word. But he probably did not discern initially that it was the Lord speaking to him. Until Jesus said, Peter, that revelation you just got, right? Snap church, snap Uh, uh, what's the word keep a snapshot in your mind Peter of that whole experience because that experience is a picture of how you receive revelation the heavenly father gave you that are you with me and then he released this crazy word my goodness my time is up (laughs) he released this word that many of us have quoted and really I want to just stay here he says My father is in heaven, yeah? Okay, verse 18. I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I believe when he says that rock, he means this rock of revelation, that I am the Christ, the the son of the living God. He says, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Because of time, I'm going to just zoom in on that verse, and then we're going to go into prayer. Jesus declares to Peter his name. Everyone who was listening to Jesus knew that he was talking to Peter. Yet Peter says to, sorry, Jesus says to Peter, 
you are Peter. Well, it's just like me coming and saying to John, you are John. Doesn't make any sense, right? Everyone knows he is John. Everyone knows I'm James. Everyone knows that. There's a reason why I believe this is written the way it's written and captured in Scripture. Because Jesus then goes on to give a revelation of Peter. And what God had called Peter to. Because really, when you look at the apostles, Peter became the leader. The one who became the voice. Who was used on the day of Pentecost. To communicate the burden of heaven and cause 3,000 people to come into the kingdom. So this is a significant moment. He's saying, you are Peter, and on this rock of revelation you have received, I will build my church. So in essence, Peter starts to have a revelation of the church. We're going to come to that in a moment. But why did God declare to Peter that he is Peter? I believe it's because Peter had to have a revelation of who he was in the spirit. And you will not catch a revelation of who you truly are until first you have a revelation of who he truly is. Your destiny and your calling is hidden in your revelation of who Jesus is. As in he's, him revealing himself to you personally. Thank God for services like this. Thank God for meetings like this. But there's some things that God doesn't want to do in this meeting. He wants, to do, he wants to do when you get alone with him. Yeah. Jacob had to wrestle with God alone. Family gone, possessions gone, everything gone. It was only when he got alone that the wrestling started. Yeah. And that wrestle led to the changing of his name, his destiny. There's some things that God wants to reveal to you when you get alone with him. Some of you are seeking for clarity about destiny and what to do next. And it's not wrong to seek for those things. But I want to say to you that as you dig deeper into being with God and having revelation of who God really is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Ghost is to you, in that revelation, your destiny is unraveled. You're hidden in him. It's not something you try to isolate. You can't, if you're truly walking accurately with God, you can't isolate the fulfillment of your destiny and purpose effectively from Him. However, many people do it because they come to church for all sorts of reasons. They come to church because life is difficult, you know, family life, finances, health challenges. And so the intensity of their pursuit of God, the the texture of their pursuit is based on the current circumstance of life they're in. So the pursuit is based on pressure, is based on the need for breakthrough. And oftentimes when that breakthrough passes, the intensity of pursuit ceases. So the pursuit into God was not really for God's sake. It was for what we wanted him to do. And that is where we end up in this vicious cycle that causes us to miss the purposes of God, especially when seasons change. Because we have to develop a pattern of seeking the Lord that's based on just seeking Him only for who He is, not for what He can do. Okay, so if God were not to answer your prayer for a new job, if God were not to bless you, if God were not to open the doors you're crying out for, would you still seek Him with the same intensity? If, okay, let me make it real. If God were not to give you the husband you're praying for. If God were not to give you the spouse you're believing for. Would you still seek him with the same intensity? If you can develop your walk with God to get to the place where you're seeking him regardless. Like, I, I, I believe it was Peter in the apostles that says, Where else can we go, Lord? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. When you get to that place where you're like, Lord, I have no other option. That is a healthy place to remain in. In that place is where revelation about who you really are start to be unraveled more and more. We can go more into that, but I'm going to pause there. Because where I'm going to land this is the next part where it says, and I will build my church. Who's doing the building? I'll read it again. It says, and I will build my church. Who's doing the building? So this is the first time the word church is used in scripture. And that word church here 
is the Greek word ecclesia. Ecclesia is not a congregation as we know it today. Ecclesia, they're like governing authorities over regions. So let me just explain the way I understand it. If Rome conquer, if, if Rome were to conquer a region, let's say Rome conquered Manchester. The culture of Manchester is already, as it is, different to the culture of Rome. So Rome sends a group of people known as the Ecclesia. And their job is to go to Manchester and infiltrate the different spheres of society to cause Manchester to look like Rome. Are you with me? So that governing body that sent from Rome to Manchester, they're called Ecclesia. So the Ecclesia are not just to meet together and have a nice worship service and have a nice time and be blessed. The Ecclesia are called to advance the purposes of the kingdom of God. The Ecclesia are called to change atmospheres where they go. The Ecclesia are not thermostats. They're thermometers. Sorry. The Ecclesia are not thermometers. They're thermostats. Thermometers conform to the temperature. Thermostats change the temperature. The Ecclesia are called to influence spaces with the life of God, with the fire of God, with the presence of God. The Ecclesia have a revelation of who they are. I want to say to you, the church, in my view at the moment, has not quite risen to that Ecclesia mandate. Because today the church has become a nursery where babies are being fed and not a barracks where warriors are being bred. God is wanting to raise up an ecclesia, an army. So Jesus says, I will build. Who is doing the building? Jesus. Now, the fact that a church is growing in number does not mean Jesus is the one building it. The fact that 50,000 believers gathered to worship service or gather for a conference does not mean Jesus is the one that mobilized them. Listen to me, because in the age we're living in, many Christians have sacrificed their discernment at the altar of gifted musicians and gifted preachers. So their discernment is out the window because someone can preach good. Their discernment is out the window because someone can sing good. The fact that crowds are gathering, the fact that the Christian musician or worship leader has written a great song and has millions of followers does not mean that Jesus is the one building that, that platform. <laughs> hear me, hear me, hear me well. The fact that someone is famous and they're a Christian and they have a massive following and everyone is like, wow, 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 does not mean Jesus is the one behind that popularity. Hear me. Hear me well. There are lots of things growing right now that Jesus is not building. Jesus says, I will build. Who's building? Who's building? Okay, so if Jesus is building, we need to understand how Jesus builds. Because when we understand how Jesus builds, then we can start to look around us to see when we look at the content and when we look at the culture of a movement, of a person, of a preacher, of a singer, if we cannot see the DNA that links us back to the building materials that Jesus uses, we know that he is not the one building this. When we look at Jesus' life, when we look at the apostles' life, when we look at the early church, when we look at church history, when the church has been growing numerically and the church has been growing in impact, there are certain common denominators that you can't shake off. It's all through history, all through the scriptures. Holiness. Fasting. Prayer. Intercession. Love for God and for people. When you look through history, you see the DNA. So 
If your movement and your church or your business, because that's in cool marketplace people too, your, if your business, your movement, your church, and everything you're doing for God as a Christian, if it's growing, okay, and we examine the culture and the content, and we don't see these things, something else is responsible for that growth and not the Holy Ghost. Great oratory, great speak, pe- there are people that can speak good. They can, they, can, they can talk, they can preach you into a frenzy. But they are walking in darkness at the same time. There are people that can sing you into whatever, you know. And you're like, why, 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 what a gift. But at, when you probe deeper, you realize their lifestyle does not align with anything we've said. And you see, we live in an, a, in an Instagram generation, TikTok generation, where we're so driven by what we see on social media. And some people can make themselves look so good online. But when you meet them in person, there is no content. It's all a show. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I will build. He, he, he's taking personal responsibility for the building. And then he says, I will build my church, the ecclesia. But then later he gets angry and picks up a whip and starts whipping people in the temple. Because they're doing things of merchandise that they shouldn't be doing. And then he says this, my house. See, see connect that to the ecclesia. He says, my house. He didn't say my house because a house of prophecy. Now, I'm not saying prophecy is wrong. He didn't say my house will be called a house of worship. I'm not saying worship is wrong. He didn't say my house will be called a house of healing. He didn't say my house will be called a house of dancing. He didn't say my house will be called a house of celebration. He said my house. So he's taking personal responsibility. The house he's building is going to be called a house of prayer. Now, there are different types of prayer. There are some Christians who are gathering in mass. And when you examine the content of their prayer, it's selfish. All they want in their prayer meetings is for their enemies to fall down and die. And when they say enemies, they're not, sometimes they're not referring to demonic powers. They're thinking about people. So all they're praying about is their haters. They're praying... But they're not praying with the DNA of the house. Prayer meetings are happening everywhere. But we're not really causing an impact in the spirit realm. Because we're not allowing Jesus to build us with his DNA. He qualifies it. He says, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. So what... what, what identifies the house he's building is intercessory prayer for his agenda. And he captures it in the Lord's Prayer. My king, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, he says, uh, you said we should pray. Uh, my kingdom come, my will be done. And what's that? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's wanting his kingdom to come. He's, you see, when, he, when his kingdom comes, there's warfare because he's going to dismantle whatever is already there. So that's warfare already. His purpose is being done, dismantles the agenda of humans and demons. So my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And what I'm trying to say to you is, you can start out good and end up wrong. You can start in the spirit and end in the flesh. Many people, when they start out, they're desperate for God. But then as God starts to use you, you get carried away by your own giftings. And so you stray away from the ancient paths. And now what's sponsoring the growth of your ministry is your reputation and your gifting. But not your consecration. And people are applauding you But heaven is grieved. Because the only way you're going to stay accurate in God is not based on your Bible knowledge. We can all get deceived so easily. The only way you're going to stay accurate 
is to keep your pursuit of God pure. Disconnected from platforms, opportunities, money, breakthroughs or no breakthroughs. To keep that pursuit pure is actually your safety to stay accurate with God. You can't rely on your giftings. Jesus is wanting to build his house of prayer. Can you play house of prayer? Do you know house of prayer? Make me a house of prayer. Just go to the six. Just stay on the six. Yeah, just stay there. And kind of, can I have the musicians come up? Um, I, I want us to go into this place uh, where we're asking the Lord to shake off from us the distorted perspective that we have embraced. Some of you in this room are pursuing something. It's like you're pursuing a mirage. I don't know if that makes any sense. You think serving God, you think being used by God is something. But that's not actually what it is. He's actually wanting you to realize that at the core is what I am saying right here. He's calling you to be with him. Because that's where he builds men. That's where he builds women. With him. So there's, there's, there's something greater behind closed doors than on a platform. He wants to build his church in the United Kingdom. In fact, he is doing that. It's just sometimes the way he's building is not the way we want him to build. And so sometimes we can deviate from the spirit and go into the flesh and want to do it in fleshly ways. And, you know, but we may draw a crowd. We may, we may get a certain level of success in the flesh, but we actually are setting up ourselves for failure in the future. He's wanting to build something that will not fall when the pressure increases. You know, these are scary days we're living in. These are very scary days we're living in. How many of you truly want to move of God? My hand is up too. Because you want to move of God, you can't have that move. In fact, you can do it two ways. You can try to go the shortcut, which ends up in a destruction further down the line. Or you can go God's way, which is often the long way and the painful way and the narrow way and the way that looks like, you know, people may even look at you and go, you know, what are you doing with your life? You're not, you know, it seems like nothing is happening. But actually, you're in the process. God is dealing with things in your life. So many leaders are so quick to want God to lift them up. Without realizing the enemy is so happy to lift you up. As long as you are lifted up with all those issues undealt with. Because when you get lifted up, then he knows he can easily pull you down. Because he's got the remote control to switch your channel anytime. Because your emotions have not been dealt with. Because Jesus did not build you. You went the quick way. I feel that the Lord is wanting to call us to the place of intimacy with him again. Saying, Lord, build me. Someone say, Lord, build me. Lord, shake everything that can be shaken. Shake everything that needs to be shaken. Build me to be your house of prayer. Do you want to stand with me right now? If you can pray in the spirit, just take a few moments to pray right now. Malaya, 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 Malaya. Valaiza zaine molo do veze via la da bala baba bae. Malana monde belia capaile de voza vala da banda vae.
Haya banda vesto ko bailene veke paileya. Balada bande bele de vostro balada bande bele de ba. Rava vai ze bele de banda kataile de vondai. Alaza vai na vaza kataile de bolada bande bele de banda. Malahe 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 ya namoa. Ze balota ile va vaza balada banda ba yo. Abalada bonda ba le ze veke taile da bolada banda balada ba ya. Balatai le ze vele de bala boa. Father, we want to turn away from man-made buildings. We turn away from man-made structures. Unless the Lord builds a house, they that build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds a house, they that build labor in vain. So Father, build this house of prayer. Build this house of prayer. Build this house of prayer. Hasa taile bana munda bala kadama. Eba baile de banda baile ze bala davo. Baba bai na ya sando la kataine. Vazayo na kataine. Ya vaizo na 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 kataine. Eba baile eba baile. Eba baile eba baile. Eba baile eba baile. Abasa tale ke baido. Rama manda ibeza kaina. Abasa talo daya. Abasa talo daya. Amanda ganda bezayo. Alezayo. 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 Abakata kaya. Atanayo. 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 A shaken. A shaken. A shaken. Abasa tale kabo. Ebele de bayo. Abanda daya. Build us. Build us, build us, build us, build us, build us. Malabayo, 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 Malabayo. Hey, 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 Malabayo. Santa Tile Kamba Levayo. Vasa Tile Dabaya. Esavala Dabanda Kayo. Eveza Venda Kataloa. Rebe Vanden Ganson Valia. Vanden Danto Baya. Vasa Tile de Banda. Banda bande bele de banda, e babola za keto, beza baila na manda, vaza kaida da lola ya, fire, hey, bala da banda, bela da banda, hasa na mana hasa ya, oh, fire. Reignite altars that have gone dead in this room, Lord. We rebuild the broken altars this morning. We rebuild the broken altars of prayer. We rededicate ourselves to you, Jesus. We want you to build us with your DNA. And your DNA is prayer. Build us, Jesus. Valai nea sotayo. Makayo, Makayo, Makayo. Build us, Jesus. We don't want to get distracted by gifted preachers and gifted musicians. We don't want to get distracted by our own giftings. Build us, Jesus, with your DNA. Let the ecclesia arise. From intimacy to authority, let the ecclesia arise. I'm going to transition and hand over shortly. But there's a couple of things I want to do before I hand over. First thing is this, I know that this word is convicting many of you in this room. And the Lord is just asking you simply, rebuild the broken altars. Because there's fire that he's wanting to release. Rebuild the broken altars. Remember your consecrations. 
don't stray away from your consecrations. Some of you have had seasons where the Lord led you to turn off the media and TV and you were going deep in Him. And those seasons are long gone now. He's saying to you, don't live far away from consecrations. You can start in the spirit and end in the flesh. We are all capable of that. Rebuild the broken altars. Practically, at the end of this service, you might want to take some time to just reflect and talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, this is what it's going to look like starting today or starting tonight or starting tomorrow morning. And let Him lead you. Be real. Be honest. He wants to release a fresh fire on your altar. That's the first thing. The second thing, we'll do this very quickly, but I really failed to do this at this service. I feel there's someone here that's struggling with chronic fatigue. And the Lord wants to release breakthrough over you. If that's you, just come forward. Chronic fatigue. We break it off you in the name of Jesus. Whatever the source of this is, Father, right now in Jesus' name, we curse it to the root. Rebe bai la da Come on, church, just pray over them right now. Hamananda i vezaka tai le da bola zaveka andea. We break the yoke of chronic fatigue in the name of Jesus. Spirit of infirmity. We take authority over you right now. Loose your hold. Loose your hold. Loose your hold in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, 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 loose your hold, loose your hold. Come on, church, lift your voice and pray for them right now. Oh, we release the fire, the fire that brings order, order over your chemicals in your body, chemical balance. Everything that's out of order, we speak order right now in the name of Jesus. Lava baile, baba baile, baba baile. Order, order in the name of Jesus. Baba baile de mandebaya. Hey! Oh! The devil is a liar. 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 Order, order. We curse. Chronic fatigue to its roots right now in the name of Jesus. Yoke be broken, be broken, be broken now in Jesus' name. Balain day, balain day, e balazo vaca tale dayo, a vaca tale dayo, a vaca tale dayo, valeo, 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 hey, 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 baba baya baba, e basa dayo. Hey Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Vela namba le de bondai vesa kaine. Vela dabo raba bondai. Vesa vai se, baba vai se, baba vai se. Malanamai. Listen, just bring it down. Honestly, I had no idea there were so many people. I actually thought it was just one person. I had a woman in my head when I had that word. However, I know sometimes these words are kind of relevant for many people. I had no idea how massive this is in terms of lots of response. So before we wrap up, I want us to stretch our hands towards these people and we're going to pray again. Because I feel there is an element of this that is an attack of the enemy. There's an element of this that's paralyzing your physical strength and so in fact there's even someone here that that this whole situation 
it's, it's kind of become a restriction for you in serving God. Like the things you want to do for God, you feel paralyzed. That's because it's an assignment of the enemy. So come on, church. You know, this is a house of prayer, right? I want to hear your prayer. Just this next few moments, we're going to transition the service. So, Father, right now, as we lift our voices in prayer, every assignment of the enemy over any individual that's responded out here, every attack that's launched in witchcraft, every spell that has been released, every decree spoken from any coven, from any realm, in the sea, in the skies, in the forests, wherever it has been released as a decree against these people that has become a limitation in their bodies. Right now, Father, I arise with divine authority in the name of Jesus and I superimpose the superior covenant of the blood of Jesus against every negative decree of darkness. We plead the blood of Jesus and we release the blood to the root of this issue. Now we say the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. We reverse the spell. We break the decree. We reverse the covenants and break the covenants of darkness. We say chronic fatigue, spirit of infirmity, go. Go, 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 now, in the name of Jesus. Valae, 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 Valae. Baba baile, baba baile, baba baile. Ha. Just lift your hands with me. Jesus, we thank you. The yoke of darkness be broken. Altars of prayer be rebuilt in this place. That your fire will be so strong upon your people <laughs> that the enemy would regret the day. The enemy will regret the day that he formulated some weapons against you because those attacks are launching you into a deeper place like never before a deeper place of fire a fierce focus and a fresh fire i release that over you in the name of jesus god bless you jesus Jesus, Jesus, just stay here for a moment. James is back with us tonight for our rig service at 6.30. Can we just honor James for a moment? We thank God for your life. But I don't think we're quite finished yet. I'm, I'm going to invite Rebecca just to come back and just sing for us just for a moment. But... The pattern of the Bible is always the same. It never changes. He comes to the temple and his first act is to empty the temple. Then he calls the temple the house of prayer. And then he begins to heal the sick. Can I tell you that pattern is throughout the Bible. He empties. He fills. And then he pours out. That's why he says that there must be times of repentance in order that refreshing may come from the Lord. We repent, we pray, and then we pour. Come on, are you with me this morning? And I believe this morning that before we leave here, that for some, we need a moment of repentance. I believe this morning we need to just come 
in this atmosphere and decide that anything in us that is stopping the flow of the Holy Spirit needs to go this morning. Whether that's our race, whether it's the fact we are white, I am white. I need to be calm in church. Can I tell you, James preached to the black people. Let me preach to the white people for a moment. Your whiteness does not give you a right to be quiet. You say, well, that's, that, that's, that's a black thing. That passion thing is an African thing. That is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> Empty yourself. Can, can, can I tell you the white church is often the most proudful church I've ever met in my life. It needs to humble itself. It thinks it has everything when it has nothing. Jesus would be writing a letter right now if he, he could. <laughs> Repent. I was chatting with Becca just a moment ago and she was saying, in fact, Becca, just come. Because I, 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 I think some introverts need to repent. I, I, I think some extroverts need to repent. Sh share what the Lord was showing you. So, um, you know... The ages are changing, which means more research is being done into like personality traits and how we express ourselves and things of that nature. But what I was saying to um, Pastor John is that I really feel that we use that as an excuse um, in the presence of the Lord. We put it down to, well, that's just my nature. Um, but I feel that the Lord is encouraging you today to really go back to the drawing board and ask why. Because some of the reasons why we're so introverted is because of trauma. We're afraid that if we really show up, we won't be loved. So we've adopted it and made it our identity even before, like James said, our original identity, which is as a son and daughter of God. And for the extroverts, maybe ask yourself, why am I so rah with everything that I do? Again, is it a trauma thing? Maybe as a little girl or a little boy, I didn't have a voice. It was taken from me. But now that I'm grown, I'm going to do everything in everyone's face when it makes them uncomfortable. Like just all the reasons why, why. And some of these things can prohibit us from being um, a, a prayerful people, um, not just on a surface level, but praying fervently. So that's just what I kind of expressed. Come on. Now, now, hear me this morning. I'm not going to ask you to repent for being black. I'm not going to ask you to repent for being white. But I am going to ask you to repent for allowing anything to stand between you and your relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to ask you to repent for being an introvert. I'm not going to ask you to repent for being that little bit extra. But I am going to ask you to repent for anything that has stopped you from being filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know what your blockage is this morning. But I hear the Holy Spirit wanting us to go a little bit deeper. Past the obvious sins. And to say this morning, you know what, Lord, empty me. Empty me of any pride this morning. Jesus, I pray right now in this atmosphere. That we'd empty ourselves. We humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. We fall upon the rock this morning. Lest the rock fall upon us. And we say this morning, God, anything not of you, drive it out of us this morning. Any spirit not of you, drive it from our temples this morning. That you would make us a house of prayer. God, I pray that you break the spirit of prayerlessness offers no matter what the obstacle is today 
empty us of pride that would say we are sufficient in ourselves today. We say we need the Holy Spirit. We need you, Jesus. We are not enough without you. Fill us with your fire again. Fill us with your Holy Spirit again. God, we need you to come to this temple. And so we empty ourselves that you would fill us today. Fill us with the Holy Ghost and fire again. That we would pour out in this house. Emptied. Filled. And pouring out. Make us a house of prayer. Everyone say it together. Say, make us a house of prayer. Make me a house of prayer. Empty me. Fill me. Pour me out. Empty me. Fill me. Pour me out. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord a shout of praise in this place? Becca, will you lead us one more time? Hallelujah. What a time of gathering, amen. Again, to the leaders of this house, I thank you for having me. To um, James, thank you for an amazing word. And um, we're leaving here empty of ourselves and full of him, amen? Amen. 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 So we're just going to decree this as we leave the house. We all know the song. And we're just going to sing it together as we've sang so far. Um, And it just goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Sing. I have decided to follow, no turning back, no turn. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turn.
made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Say goodbye, world, say goodbye, world. Shout a praise in this place. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, yay. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can we honor Becca, folks, one more time? Hallelujah. Just stretch out a hand across the room. And may the outrageous love of the Father, the extravagant grace of Master Jesus, and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Your best days are ahead of you. God's not finished with you yet. He's making you a house of prayer for the nations. He says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. And in this season, as you empty, He fills. And He's going to pour you out as an offering to every person around you. And goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. You'll be the head and not the tail. Blessed when you come in, blessed when you go out. Your barns will be full, your vats will be full, your bank accounts will be full. And even the blessings will overtake you in this season and your cups will run over in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. We love you. We'll see you next time. Hang around for fellowship. Don't forget we're back tonight, 6.30, here in the building. Double portion Sunday. Amen. See you there.